era. Well, history is not bereft of leaders who have inspired the imagination of communities and populations, or for that matter, even triggered revolutions. However, very few, if any, have had the kind of universal appeal or influence as that of Mahatma Gandhi. Gandhi's legacy and teachings have global influence. From Martin Luther King Jr. to Nelson Mandela, and from Ho Chi Minh and even the Dalai Lama. Nearly every great leader has sought to learn or borrow from the principles of this rare great man. In this special telecast today, we will analyze the impact that Mahatma Gandhi has had on the world. Joining me on the program today are Dr. Arvind Gupta, Director Vivekananda International Foundation, Professor Imran Kovadia, University of Cape Town, South Africa, and Dr. Galina Alexeva, Head Research Department, Tolstoy Museum Estate, Russia. Thank you to all my guests for joining me on this special telecast. All right, Mr. Gupta, let me start the program with you first. Let's try and analyze and understand the kind of impact that Mahatma Gandhi has had on the globe or the world. You rightly observed, Frank, that uh, uh, he continues to be relevant today. Uh, the question that we have to ask is, why is he relevant even today? He was born in the 19th century and he died 72 years ago. The world has changed since then. And yet, uh, Mahatma Gandhi remains uh, very relevant. And I think that is because uh, the world uh, is uh, very troubled uh, as we speak. Uh, there is a lot of violence in the world. Uh, there is a lot of inequality in the world. All kinds of protests are happening. Uh, interstate relationships are all uh, quite uh, affected. And despite the enormous wealth that has been created in the world over the last few years, the world sorely misses something. There is little happiness. There is uh, tension. COVID has created all kinds of uncertainties. So, and also we have... Uh, weapons of mass destruction, all kinds of restraints which used to be there, they are going away. And I think uh, uh, people are asking for answers to those questions. And uh, they turn to uh, Mahatma Gandhi, precisely because of what you said. I think his teachings are uh, very uh, universal. So although he lived uh, and worked in a different era, but I think his, the, the reason for the why his the teachings are so universal are because he had based his uh, life and thinking on two very important principles which he culled out from his readings and from his experiments. And one of them uh, was uh, the, the search for the truth. And he said, uh, truth is God. Not God is truth, but truth is God. And the second is uh, nonviolence. And from these twin principles, he derived the philosophy and the methodology of Satyagraha, and the entire philosophy which dealt with politics, which dealt with the social issues and so on and so forth. But the fact that he had distilled these principles uh, of uh, non-violence and truth and self-realization from uh, his readings of the Hindu scriptures, uh, from the readings of uh, Christianity and other religions of the world, he was influenced by Tolstoy, he was influenced by uh, uh, theosophists, and so he was open to the ideas. But in the end, he distilled these principles for himself, and he found that the force, the force of truth, which is really coming out of renunciation, that would be the most important force. And I think that is why he, he uh, you know, he was really not interested in anything which is personal, and uh, he was uh, very confident because uh, of that force of truth and which is reflected in his methodology of Satyagraha. Uh, and he achieved many things and that's why he continues to be relevant. Okay. We'll come back to this point of uh, his relevance as of today. We are, I'll just come back to you, Imran, in just a bit. But before that, let me go across to uh, Galina because uh, 
uh, Arvind Gupta raised the issue of Tolstoy and you know how the friendship uh, uh, existed and how much the Mahatma learned from Tolstoy. And since we have the uh, head of the research department of the Tolstoy uh, Museum Estate, I must go across to her and find out from her. You know, uh, let's talk about an aspect that is not very widely spoken about, the friendship really between Tolstoy and uh, uh, M.K. Gandhi and what is it that they shared between each other? What is it that the principles, what common principles did they have? Uh, in Tolstoy's spiritual universe, uh, Gandhi occupied a very, a very special place. And Tolstoy's personal library, uh, which has been registered in the UNESCO World Heritage Documentary Heritage, reflects uh, Tolstoy's interest in India uh, and Tolstoy's interest uh, in Gandhi's activities. Uh, through Atrachnat Das and Mahatma Gandhi, Tolstoy became acquainted uh, about uh, the uh, independent uh, Indian independent movement. Uh, and you know, in the last years of Tolstoy's life, in the last decade of his life, Yasna Palyana became a very uh, a special Russian Mecca where so many pilgrim, pilgrims used to come. And one of them was from India. Uh, he was the journalist from the Indian uh, Indian magazine, The Light of India. His name was Pundit and Krishna. He interviewed uh, Tolstoy about the same issues which uh, Gandhi and Leo Tolstoy were united. Uh, the ideas of non-violence and civil disobedience. When Tolstoy knew about Indian independent movement and about Gandhi's activities, he became greatly interested uh, in Gandhi uh, because he understood that uh, Tolstoy's appreciation of ideas of nonviolence uh, and also uh, the ideas of nonviolence proclaimed by the American abolitionist William Lloyd Garrison, uh, the American uh, philosopher, transcendentalist, and poet uh, Henry David Thoreau were the same. Uh, and they say now that Thoreau was the seed, uh, Tolstoy was the tree, and Gandhi was the fruit. Uh, Tolstoy Gandhi's correspondence became, uh, began uh, during the last year of Tolstoy's life, uh, from October 1909 till October 10, uh, 1910, when Tolstoy left Chiasna Palana and died several years later. But this, their correspondence, Tolstoy and Gandhi's letter, uh, letters, they reflect their similarity uh, in appreciation, the ideas of nonviolence and civil disobedience. And, Tolst and Gandhi sent the book with one of his letters, the book about Gandhi written by Joseph Doak was sent. And Tolstoy read the, this book with a pencil in his hand. In his hand, and this book is in his study on the shelf. Uh, and Tolstoy's favorite uh, pencil, pencil notes, and the not a banner. There are so many not a banners on the pages of Mahatma, of the book Mahatma Gandhi uh, as a patriot uh, in South Africa. So, uh, and this book uh, gave Tolstoy more information about Gandhi. Right. So talking about South Africa, then Imran, I'll have to bring you in now. You know, uh, we know the connection that uh, uh, the Mahatma had with South Africa. It's all well documented. You know, we study it in our history books as well. And we know that South Africa as a nation too, through Nelson Mandela, has taken a lot in from Mahatma Gandhi and has taken it forward as well. Take us through that. Well, I agree entirely with what Galina said. I've actually just finished writing a book or published a book about uh, Gandhi, Mandela and Tolstoy. And uh, I thought one one interesting thing to think about, one of the many things they have in common. And, they, you know, uh, Gandhi read Tolstoy very closely. Tolstoy, as, as Galina has pointed out, was very attracted by the idea of Gandhi. Mandela, interestingly, the only novel he talks about at length is War and Peace, which he read on Robben Island. And he read it because 
the prison censors had forgotten to take it out. They were trying to take out all the books with war in the title, and they forgot to take out War and Peace, so he ended up reading it. And it's the only book he, he really talks about in terms of leadership in his entire life, all his journals and letters. And he singles out from that book one character, uh, a field marshal, Kutuzov, right, who is the kind of historical spirit of the novel. And the interesting thing about Kutuzov is that he was a general, a field marshal. He was a military commander, so he was a man of violence. At the same time, Tolstoy makes him a man of mercy and charity. He says that he's the strangest kind of military commander because he spares human life. Right? He's interested in reducing violence. And clearly, Mandela saw that as a very important part of his own understanding of leadership. But uh, Gandhi's, you know, we often talk about Gandhi's apprenticeship uh, in South Africa. Uh, I think in many ways, South Africa was a very, was a kind of trivializing and brutalizing environment for him. I mean, obviously, within days of, of getting into the country, he'd gotten into numerous fights, he thrown out of a courtroom and a train and assaulted on a, a stagecoach. And what's interesting about those first 10 or 15 years is he's kind of making his way towards a radical vision of the kind he finally finds uh, in Leo Tolstoy in kind of 1905 and 1906. And of course, uh, through their correspondence. And I think uh, if I can mention just one or two of the aspects of that, one very important thing they have in common is an interest in manual labor and getting your hands dirty. You know, Tolstoy decided to do his own laundry. Well, when Mandela as president insisted on making his own bed, even though he was the president, you know, um, insisted on shining his own shoes, or when Tolstoy insisted on making his own uh, sandals, what they were telling us is that there can't be a separate, even with the most powerful and most extraordinary human beings in the world, there must never be a separation uh, between them and ordinary people, and, and ordinary work must always be honored. Um, I think that's one thing. The other thing that they have given us is an amazing ability to incarnate these vast collectivities, right? Gandhi with India, Tolstoy with Russia, Nelson Mandela with Africa and South Africa, and yet to incarnate them without antagonism. You know, Tolstoy's patriotism, such as it was, like Mandela's patriotism, has no enemy, has no uh, enmity in it whatsoever. And I think that's another way in which they're extremely valuable to us today. Absolutely. All right, taking the discussion forward now, Mr. Gupta, let me come across to you. You know, uh, there's no doubt that uh, the Mahatma Gandhi is regarded by many as the greatest leader of the Indian independence movement. But let's talk about another aspect. You know, what kind of an impact has he had on movements and leaders around the world? Gandhi uh, turns out to be a arch protester. He's protesting forever. He's protesting against the system. He's standing with someone, uh, securing somebody's rights. And he is also a rebel. As he said, he, was, he has very radical, unorthodox views. He is also trying to reform things, but he was, of course, never in uh, uh, power. So he is always trying to reform maybe people's mind, changing mindsets, trying to mobilize people. So the entire life, he is trying to do something and trying to uh, change something. And he is himself the agent of change. So I think this aspect of Gandhi has influenced uh, many people. And today we see that the protest movements across the world, uh, they study Gandhi and take something out of uh, uh, his uh, uh, lives and works. I mean, you mentioned uh, Ho Chi Minh, for instance, Ho Chi Minh. Uh, Ho Chi Minh uh, is a revolutionary. And he see, says that uh, Gandhi is our guide. So I think uh, Gandhi is uh, very important for most of the people who are trying to protest and change things. So I think that is one of the greatest uh, impacts that uh, Gandhi has had. But at the same time, as I said, Gandhi is a also deeply spiritual. And I think his uh, uh, thoughts on the morality he sees uh, uh, and his uh, views on ends and means and the fact that he is essentially searching for the truth. I think this is a philosophical aspect which also has impressed people. And uh, today, when we see that the world is so conflicted, what is the role of morality? I think that is also people are trying to study. What is the role of morality in our daily lives, in interstate relations, and uh, you know so many other things that we do? So uh, Gandhi sets very high standards uh, for himself. And you see, 
he doesn't preach unless he himself is convinced of something he is not he, there is no difference between what he says and what he does so i think that also impresses people and he himself set so high standards for himself that he says that look he has not reached where he has uh, he would have liked to reach so i think these uh, uh, attributes of gandhi uh, also impress people and uh, we, we must see gandhi beyond politics also that is uh, very important and that is i think one reason uh, why he is relevant uh, today absolutely all right so talking about his relevance let's talk about a couple of his principles you know galina you brought that up in your opening remarks about civil disobedience and non violence if you look at the world today there is violence practically everywhere we've seen several groups and several nations taking up arms against each other at a time when everyone is busy fighting with missiles and talking about you know nuclear warheads how relevant is something like a civil disobedience or non violence i think even in in that time in tolstoy's time and gandhi's time at the at the turn of the century uh, i think uh, the world was uh, full of aggression and full of weapons and there was the wars were here and there and that is why so many people uh, from europe america asked uh, tolstoy to raise his voice against this or that war uh, and uh, of course the ideas the ideas of civil disobedience and nonviolence are very relevant even today uh, and people should read such articles and such essays like a letter to hindu written by tolstoy uh, actually it's a reply to tarakhnat uh, das uh, letter uh, to leo tolstoy and he wrote that letter which became uh, a real uh, essay a letter to hindu uh, in in this letter uh, tolstoy uh, shows demonstrates his profound his deep sympathy uh, to the indian independent movement to the ideas uh to the ideas of non violence and civil disobedience as Tolstoy himself uh, understood them and as Gandhi uh, and um, the american abolitionist and the american pacifists understood those ideas of non violence and civil disobedience and i think uh, nowadays uh, we should read such uh, such addresses such uh, such essays written by Tolstoy more than 125 or 130 years ago just about peace and non-violence okay all right Imran let me bring you in now you know as far as uh, uh, you know this world is concerned is there place for someone with radical views you know when we talk about radicalism today we always look at it with the perspective of terror you know at some at some point but let's keep terror aside and talk about someone with radical ideas someone who is different someone who is cut out of a different uh, cloth is there a place for someone like that in today's world i think more than a place it's um when we talk about yes when we talk about radical thinking we mean someone who reasons from first principles and tries to live according to those principles and practices a politics appropriate to those principles from issues of non-violence uh, in uh, police relationships to civilians to our relationship as human beings to animals to our relationship to the environment these ideas of non-violence are really in are really probably the dominant and and the most productive ideas of our time if anything the very the, the the themes around which Gandhi seemed to falter in the 1940s, right? Uh, religious violence, the atomic bomb, the rise of weaponry, which meant you could kill people from far away. If anything, the way that those things have developed has, I think, in uh, has many ways proved Gandhi right or suggested the strength of his position. You know, why did we avoid an atomic holocaust, right? Why was there no showdown between the Soviet Union and the United States? It wasn't. You know, these were highly antagonistic powers, but at the same time, Gandhi, Tolstoy, uh, Emerson, Thoreau, Nelson Mandela, they belonged to a kind of international force of public, uh, public opinion, right, which was strongly pacific and strongly opposed to the kind of wars that states wanted to fight with each other. It's true that um, Tolstoy's uh, first let letter to a Hindu was kind of opposed to terroristic violence. 
right, um, to kind of individuals fighting colonialism by terror. And I, you know, he's clearly right. But I think the other thing that uh, Gandhi, Tolstoy, and Mandela share is a certain skepticism about the violence of the state and even of the capacities of the state. And I think one way in which it can be radical is, in many ways, they help us to let go of the fixed ideas of the right and the left about the state, about community, and, you know, to, to, to think about what do communities have to do for themselves, you know, what does it mean to use violence as a state against uh, external, internal enemy, how do we use violence in our, in our own lives, you know, how do we liberate ourselves from those things. I think as individuals those questions are alive, but also as social movements. I think uh, Black Lives Matter turns out to have been the most um, numerously attended protests in American history, which is extraordinary given the history of that country. So Absolutely. I think they're, they're right at the center of our world. Absolutely. All right. So, Ms., uh, Mr. Gupta, so what aspects of, uh, you know, uh, Mahatma Gandhi's teachings, principles, and, you know, just the way of life and the kind of, uh, the way he lived life, what aspects of that do we need to take forward and do we need to teach our millennials? See, just... Uh, a second on the violence uh, issue, I think uh, if you try and resolve interstate conflicts using Gandhi's ideas today, mm. I think it is not going to be that easy. If you talk about uh, the violence of the kind that ISIS is uh, perpetrating, that is not going to be easy. But then violence has many shades. And uh, I think uh, more violence there is, more relevant does non-violence become. I think that is the so, and people pine for peace or peaceful, uh, uh, you know, existence and living. So to that extent, I think uh, we need to study uh, more uh, deeply what is no, uh, violence, what is non-violence, and it is not just specificism. That is a, a caricature of uh, uh, the uh, thinking of uh, uh, Mahatma Gandhi. So what uh, aspects I think we should uh, take forward. Uh, I would think that, uh, you see, a few years ago, uh, uh, the uh, UN uh, uh, General Assembly passed a resolution. It was in 2007. And uh, Mahatma Gandhi's uh, uh, birthday, October 2nd, that became, uh, now it is celebrated as a day of non-violence. So, and the uh, last year, uh, the UN Secretary General said something very interesting. He said that uh, the UN's Agenda 2030 program is a flagship uh, program. It is really Gandhi's idea of standing with the last person, leave no one behind, or in Gandhi's terminology, it would be called Sarvodaya. That is something that informs uh, uh, UN's uh, function. So in the uh, sphere of peace, development, cooperation, uh, I think Gandhi's ideas are very relevant. Equally today, when we talk about uh, climate change and uh, the environment de degradation and ecology, and which is actually related to greed, and Mahatma Gandhi has a lot to say about uh, the greed and the overproduction, etc. I think that is another area uh, which we take forward. And this whole issue of overconsumption is leading to you know this degradation of the planet. It is something that I think, uh, again, uh, uh, Gandhi uh, uh, talked about. Then right. I feel that uh, today, in the context of globalization, when the, all the production is for profit, and not necessarily just to generate wealth, but not the, how to distribute wealth, I think Gandhi's ideas is put some kind of, uh, you know, the wealth generation. And when he talked about trusteeship uh, of the wealth, uh, these are some of the some very radical and ideas that this can be taken forward. And lastly, I think I would say that Gandhi is often painted as anti-modernization, who was against the railways, who was against modern medicine, etc., etc., who talked about the village as a production unit and so on. But if we don't caricature these ideas and look at these ideas deeply, then you find that they have a truth even today. He right. was against the exploitative nature of modernization. So I think some of these uh, questions which have been risen because climate change has become an existential threat, hmm. it should be related to this level. Absolutely. All right. So, Galina, very quickly, how do we take the message and the principles and the tenets of people like Tolstoy, Gandhi and Mandela forward? I think the ideas of 
uh, love, universal brotherhood, uh, moral self-perfection, and non-violence uh, just are very essential now. Uh, and I think that there is no way out. This is the only uh, the only path path for humanity to survive. Okay, all right. And Imran, close the show for us with your concluding remarks. You can probably take that question about millennials that I asked uh, Arun Gupta as well, because you deal with students and with uh, uh, with youngsters yeah. at the university. Hmm. Well, maybe I can tell millennials who to vote for. Um, <laughs> Gandhi said that, and it's true again for Mandela and Tosu. He said. Um, I'm only in politics because through the political lies my personal liberation. And what, I, what he means by that is the quest for self-perfection, self-improvement. I don't mean in a vain way. I mean the quest for always becoming an individually better person and the quest to pursue better political and social projects are linked together. So there's some politicians, you see them, you know, this is not a person who's interested in being a better person. Right? Try and find the politicians who seem to be in that process of movement and self-examination and on the way to improving themselves. Absolutely. All right. On that note, then, I'll call it a wrap on this edition of the special telecast. Thank you to all my guests for joining me on the program and putting things into perspective for us. What's coming out of this discussion is that the teachings of Gandhi are very relevant.